So unless you're totally new to this field or the stock market, at some point you've heard or read a safe harbor, a safe harbor for forward-looking information. They are commonly heard at the beginning of a company's earnings call, or maybe you've seen it on the first slide of an investor presentation deck. Why in the world is a company mentioning this legal mumbo jumbo when no one cares? Today on Zippy Point. I'm Brock Romanek and I'm a big fan of you. Nearly all disclosures made in the SEC filings are historical. They're looking backwards. That not, that's not much of a help to a stock market. It pretty much only looks forward, meaning that the entire exercise of drafting disclosures for SEC filings is futile. It's an, <laughs> it's an exercise in compliance, not that sexy. That's why the earnings call, the quarterly earnings call, if companies, you know, <laughs> some companies still have them, a lot of companies have gotten rid of them. And that's why it's so important to investors. The same with investor presentations. They tend to give more forward-looking information to a hungry market compared to a company's SEC filings. That's some solace for investors looking for a kernel of what management sees coming down the pike. So in order to feel comfortable when they publicly look forward, companies provide this safe harbor in an attempt to protect themselves from getting sued in, you know, if their expectations, their reasoned hopes don't match actual results. Here are five reasons why the safe harbor confounds. One, because we can. Two, judges don't like it. Three, investors don't care about it. Four, it does help refine your risk factors. Five, make it fun, or is that, or is that annoying? One, because we can. Why do we have to give this safe harbor statement? When you're in-house, you're gonna get asked that a million times. You explain once again, because it's a safe harbor and protects us from being sued later on. I understand why it's so offensive to people. <laughs> no one cares about it. It's not meant to communicate anything really. It's meant to be protective. It's a compliance thing. It's not meant to be entertaining. So let me briefly explain this legal mumbo jumbo. Enacted in 1995, the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act, known as the PSLR PSLRA, created a safe harbor for forward-looking statements to encourage companies to you know, provide forecasts and other information about future plans. In creating the safe harbor, Congress sought to limit a company's liability if it allowed investors to see behind the curtain as to what a company was hoping would result from a particular strategy. The PSLRA was enacted in part to prevent securities class actions from being filed every single time a company didn't meet its projected results. Got it? Good. <laughs> so now let's learn the difference between the safe harbor when forward-looking information is given orally, like during an earnings call, versus a writing, like an SEC filing. Under the PSLRA, the safe harbor can be provided in a different format depending on whether you hear or see <laughs> the forward-looking information. If it's oral, the law allows meaningful cautionary statements contained in an identified writing to be incorporated by reference. But even if your forward-looking information is in writing, some companies go for the minimalist approach in their 10K and in their 10Q, just a paragraph or so consisting of safe harbor language and then ref referencing the risk factors. And, you know, I have a separate vid guide about what risk factors are, but we will talk a little bit about it in this video too. The notion behind not giving a full-blown safe harbor in these filings is that there simply isn't much, if any, forward-looking information in these the 10Ks, the 10Qs, the 34 Act filings. But the quarterly earnings release, that's something different. That does likely contain some forward-looking information. So it typically has a full-blown safe harbor, which will include the safe harbor language followed by a list of risk factors, which likely is a bulleted list that regurgitates the headings from your latest official list of risk factors. Do look for my other big guide about how to invoke the safe harbor on social media like Twitter, where you're limited to 120 characters. That's in another vid guide. Two, judges don't like it. So the safe harbor forecloses liability under the federal securities laws for material misstatements or omissions if the forward-looking statement is identified as such and is accompanied by meaningful cautionary statements that identify important factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from those in the forward-looking statement. Now that's the standard. The trend over the past few decades is for courts to gradually reduce their deference to this legislative safe harbor. You're not as safe as you used to be. So in other words, the interpretation of the safe harbor in federal courts has left companies with mixed guidance about its usefulness to fend off strike suits. 
One thing we've learned from these cases is that if you're not regularly reviewing your safe harbor to update the, the factors you list, the risk factors that you're listing, you run a higher risk of losing in court. So you definitely want to update your risk factors regularly. And I do have a separate guide, big guide about updating risk factors, specifically a link to which is beneath this video. Unfortunately, even if you do everything right, you still might lose in court. Many, many judges are seeking to find ways around the safe harbor, often committing basic legal errors when they nullify them. Part of it is the judges are just not that familiar with the securities laws. I mean, you know, a judge down in some state or in a rural area just probably doesn't know anything about, right, federal agency law. Who, why would they? Another reason that some judges just don't like the disclaimer aspect of this stuff at all, or you know, after all, who likes a disclaimer, right? Unfortunately, more and more companies have stopped providing forward-looking guidance. As I mentioned, the earnings call is dying. So companies are decreasing their frequency from either quarterly or annually or just dropping their earnings calls altogether. Three, investors don't care about it. As is true with any disclaimer, you know, that fine print that <laughs> you quickly click on to confirm that you've read something, that you the disclaimer that you haven't read. It shouldn't be a surprise to you that this 2017 study found that retail investors care very little about the safe harbor. And I imagine professional investors carry, care very little about it too. So a personal story, I should mention that when I got to Lockheed Martin, I, one of the first things I did was revise the huge disclaimer linked to it from the company's homepage, the standard, this is in late 1990s, the standard one that every big company has. I put it in plain English, right after I got there uh, from the SEC at, at the end of 1998, because at that time, the plain English movement had just reached full force on the heels of the SEC's rule changes earlier that year. So I'm proud to say that my disclaimer on Lockheed Martin's homepage has survived, and it's still in plain English today. My rationale is that a court is more likely to uphold the, the validity of a disclaimer if anyone can easily understand it, right? A common sense approach to disclaimers. Four, it does help refine your risk factors. Since a safe harbor is tied to your latest set of risk factors, and the safe harbor typically is invoked more often than quarterly, the process of updating your safe harbor gets your entire disclosure team thinking about what are the company's evolving risk factors. This could be challenging to do. Not only does this lead to more robust disclosure under Item 105 of Regulation SK, that's your risk factor section that goes into your SEC filings, it should help improve the, your company's overall strategic planning efforts. This is real world value here. Five, make it fun, or is that annoying? So some companies have fun with their disclaimer, with the, with the, <laughs> the safe harbor. It acts as an icebreaker. Probably the safest time to have fun is when an officer is addressing an all employee audience. So it's, it's so awkward to give the safe harbor disclaimer when your audience is just staff and employees, but they're your shareholders too. So if you're talking at all to your employees, you know, as a big group is about future trends, future plans, you know, some people play it safe and invoke the safe harbor. But if you do it in a fun way, you're poking fun at the lawyers in the process. You can kick off your meeting on a light note. I took the fun concept a step further and even parodied the, the safe harbor, well, the risk factor section on my old site, corporateaffairs.tv, with, with a couple of videos. I should mention that quite a few companies don't even bother invoking the safe harbor in an all-employee setting. They figure employees are bound by their duties to the company to keep things confidential. This position is understandable because it's just real awkward to invoke a disclaimer in an employee town hall format. It just rubs people the wrong, want, wrong way right off the bat when there's legalese being thrown out to start a meeting. And note that there's a difference between having fun with it and too much fun. So, for example, Southwest Airlines really made a name for itself, became the fun airline when the stewards and stewardesses put their own spin on the standardized instructions before taking off, you know, about buckling your seatbelt. And then other airlines saw that and spent a fortune <laughs> producing expensive videos doing the same in a loud and boorish manner. The problem with that is that seeing that video a single time is all that a normal person can handle. But once you see the same video again and again, you're just dying for the old days when someone used a monotone voice to recite the instructions for the millionth time in their career. By the way, why in the world do they still explain how to buckle a seatbelt? <laughs> you learn that at age like four, right? So if someone asks you why you're giving the stupid disclaimer that no one cares about rather than delve into the technical reasons, maybe just give the glib answer of, Think of it like a vaccine. It might work, it might not, but better to try it rather than risk it. 
with apologies to any of you out there who are anti-vacciners.